So uh, apparently, 72% of us Brits, I've been reading about this week, are desperate for an overseas holiday. Hands up if that's you. There's yeah, quite a few of us. Yeah, we've missed out, haven't we, these past 18 months, and we've missed our overseas breaks. And my parents are big uh, travel uh, enthusiasts, and recently they gave me a whole bunch of these uh, Lonely Planet travel magazines that have been coming through their letterbox month after month and going to waste over the past year or so. And uh, they're a reminder of the first thing we do when we try to decide where we want to visit. We find out what the place is like, don't we? We find out what the place is like. And this morning we're asking a similar question in our series on Jesus and his kingdom. What is the kingdom of God like? And in these four parables which Bryn just read to us, Jesus is in some ways giving us the, the double spray, page spread, if you will, on uh, his kingdom, helping us to see just exactly what it's like. He tells us about the kingdom's size, about its effect, and about its worth. And we're going to look at those three things in just a moment. But first, let me uh, lead us in praying as we uh, come before God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to be a part of your kingdom. And Father, we pray that as we look at the kingdom of Jesus this morning, that you would help it to not just be something that's theoretical to us, but something that's real in our lives. I pray that as I speak and as we unpack these parables that Jesus told, that you would speak through me by your spirit, that you would open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say to us, to each of us this morning. In Jesus' name. So first, the kingdom size. When Jesus compares his kingdom to a mustard seed, he wants everyone listening to, to realize just how fast and how big his kingdom is going to grow. That the scale of the kingdom will reach a size way out of proportion from where it's begun, from a tiny mustard seed. You know, the mustard seed isn't literally the uh, smallest seed that you could find in Israel at the time. Uh, but it had become, by Jesus' day, a metaphor uh, for all things small and insignificant. Uh, a bit like the way we uh, talk about a, a baby fish. A baby fish is called a fry, and today we talk about something being small fry, don't we? And we want to say that something is insignificant, something is small fry. And, and in many ways, the, the parable of the mustard seed is, is saying uh, that Jesus' kingdom will start the same way. In comparison uh, to Rome or Egypt or Babylon or any of the other ancient empires, it looks like nothing. Just like it does to many people in the UK today. In fact, to begin with, most people won't even notice it, Jesus says. Think of the poppy seed uh, on a bagel. Sometimes you get bagels covered in poppy seeds, don't you? If you went out for lunch with somebody and uh, they started uh, wailing and crying that their lunch was ruined because one little poppy seed had fallen off their bagel, you'd think they were either a bit mad or they were having a very bad day indeed, wouldn't you? And, uh, and it's a bit like that, Jesus says. The way things start, uh, you wouldn't even notice it. That's how the kingdom looks to begin with. Uh, and looking at Jesus through the world's eyes, he was right, wasn't he? 100 years ago, the Canadian vicar, James Allen Francis, described Jesus' life like this. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village as the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village. He worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30, and then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, never held an office, never owned a home, never had a family, never went to college, never put his foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did any of the things that one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of popular opinion turned against him, and when he went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothes, the only piece of property he had left. And when he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. What was there to see? 
hardly much of a kingdom, was it? Not to look at to start with. Just like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field, Jesus says, it remained hidden. And in fact, Jesus made sure that it would be that way. He began his ministry with 12 men, men that we would immediately have written off. And if you read the Gospels, it's easy to see why. Plenty of times he told people uh, when he would healed them to keep it quiet. And he publicly called himself the Son of Man, not the Messiah or the Son of God, to keep his identity under wraps. So Jesus says his kingdom was like a mustard seed buried in the ground. But as Tim Farron, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, has said, then there were four days, four or five days in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, the evidence for which is staggeringly compelling, when everything, and I mean everything, changed. And like a mustard seed, the kingdom grew big and it grew fast. You know, in the right conditions, a mustard seed can grow taller than a male giraffe and wider than a football goal in the space of three months. From seed to that in three months. And Jesus wasn't just describing when he used the metaphor of a mustard seed how things were. He was describing how they would be once he rose again. And so James Allen Francis concluded his summary of Jesus' life like this. Nineteen wide centuries have come and gone, and today he is the center of the human race. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of human beings upon the earth as powerfully as has this one solitary life. He was right, wasn't he? Why? Because the kingdom of God is defined by rapid and enormous growth. And so within 300 years of the resurrection, the kingdom had grown so big and won so many people that the Roman Empire basically gave up the fight and made faith in Jesus the official state religion. And now today, 2.5 billion people in more than 200 countries, a third of the world's population, pledge allegiance to Jesus and to his kingdom. What's the kingdom like? Well, you know, it's a fact, uh, one I learned about when I was studying A-level politics, that until the 1990s, no two countries with a McDonald's had ever gone to war with each other. <laughs> Sounds impressive, doesn't it? Until you realize that that's because McDonald's couldn't get into any of the communist countries in the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. Despite their massive marketing budget, they were blocked from places like China and Russia. But Christianity, on the other hand, though illegal in all those countries, spread like a mustard tree. And when the Berlin Wall fell and the Cold War ended, suddenly there were all these Christians in these countries that nobody knew about. The number of Christians in China when, commun when the communists took over in 1949 was 1 1.8 million. And you know what? The church increased year after year, even while it was illegal, by a million people every year. So that today there are more than 75 million Christians in China. What's the take home for us? What do we make of that? Well, for one thing, doesn't that give us confidence? Confidence when we've got a bold, and as Simon and Debbie have said, sometimes scary vision for us as a church. It's a reminder that when we send a team to plant with Simon and Hannah in a few years' time, we may start small, but we can believe for something big, because that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's a message to us to always expect the unexpected from God. Doesn't that make you more excited to pray, to involve him in your life, to ask for healing, uh, to share our faith with others? It has me this week. And lastly, it reminds us not to be discouraged. I'm aware that many of us are probably the only Christian in our workplace, maybe the lone ranger in our friendship group, the only believer in our family. But this reminds us not to look at things from where you are, but to look at them from where the kingdom began, with a small mustard seed. 
You know, a few years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to go on a trip to Israel. And uh, I was standing on the beach uh, where in John chapter 21, Jesus uh, appears to his disciples after his resurrection and commissions Peter to lead his church. And as I looked across this beach, there were Christians from all countries all over the world praying and uh, worshipping in groups. And it just struck me, what would Peter have made of that if he could have seen that 2,000 years ago when Jesus commissioned him? Out of a tiny seed, 12 men in a forgotten backwater, now there's a Christian even in your family, even in your workplace, even in your university, your school, your friendship group. 2,000 years later, millions of miles away. That's the scale of Jesus' kingdom. Isn't that amazing? So what about the effect of Jesus' kingdom on individuals and on the world? The point of the parable of the yeast is that God's kingdom totally transforms every person and every society that it comes into contact with. You know, during lockdown, Amy got really into baking bread at home. And I loved waking up to the smell of freshly baked bread. It's, there's nothing quite like it, is it? It was enough to make me want lunch at 10 a.m. in the morning. So good. And we've got recipes at home with uh, bread with herbs you can add, bread with spices, bread with whatever, you name it. But the most important ingredient you can put in bread is yeast. Without yeast, all you've got is a pretty dry, pretty tasteless water cracker. Add yeast, and what have you got? Something like this. This is not just any bread. This is our MS sourdough bread, traditionally prepared for over 30 hours to achieve that crispy crust and chewy texture. This is not just bread. This is bread. What bread? MS, San Francisco style sourdough bread. I miss those adverts. Do they still do them? I don't know. Um, it's magic in your oven, yeast. It's magic in your oven. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there's something spongy and porous and tasty where there wasn't before. And Jesus says that's what happens to people and places when they come into his kingdom. They're transformed, sometimes instantly, sometimes over time. I think of a former housemate of mine who was a violent heroin addict and then found Jesus on an alpha course, straight out of prison, entered the kingdom and became a different person. And now, now he helps other offenders uh, to uh, transform their lives in the name of Jesus. Plenty of us will know people who have stories like that. But none of us actually need to look as far as someone else. None of us need to look beyond ourselves if we're in the kingdom of Jesus to, to find the yeast of the kingdom in our lives. Like me, your story might not be as dramatic as his, but I know I'm humbler. I know I'm kinder, gentler, less crass, less judgmental, more self-controlled and more reliable than I ever was before I came to Jesus or would be without him. The kingdom of heaven transforms. You go to France for the wine. You go to Greece for the beaches, Italy for the culture, Spain for the weather. But you go to the kingdom of God to be transformed. And the yeast of the kingdom doesn't just work on people. It also works on places. You know, when Europe became a Christian continent, people uh, stopped the practice of killing children born disabled or female. The old began to be properly looked after for the first time. Women got equal rights within marriage. The sick were cared for in the first hospitals. And charity was invented for the poor and homeless. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast worked through all the dough. It changes everything. Who wouldn't want a piece of that? So how do we get it? That's what Jesus wants us to know yet next. That's the point of uh, the last two parables that Bryn read. You know, most people think that putting their faith in Jesus means giving a bit and getting a bit. We give him a bit of our lives, we get a bit back. They think of the kingdom on the level of a child's piggy bank. I give him some time on a Sunday morning, maybe 
even 30 minutes a day reading my Bible and praying. I give a little bit of my money to church. Maybe I try and be a bit nicer, and in return, I get some help from God when I need it. I get an easier life. The prayers, when I can't fix things myself, get answered. But Jesus' parables mean we need to think way bigger than that, both about what we get, but also about what we give to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because coming into the kingdom isn't just like finding a £10 note in the coat you wore last winter that you've forgotten all about. It's not just a mood booster that lasts a few days. No, Jesus says coming into his kingdom is like winning a life-changing amount of money. It's like treasure hidden in a field. Do you know, back in Jesus' time, that was the closest thing you got to winning the lottery. Back then, they didn't have banks, so uh, much like today, much like places like Afghanistan that we've been praying for earlier, these, this was a region that was often caught in the twos and fro's of war, and people had to flee their homes at very little notice. And so, if you were a person of means, what did you do with the extra wealth that you couldn't take with you? If you couldn't put it in a bank, you buried it somewhere in the ground, somewhere only you'd remember, and you hoped that one day you could come back and retrieve it. Except sadly, sometimes people never came back. They were never able to retrieve that wealth. And so some very lucky person, years, maybe decades later, stumbled across it and became rich beyond their wildest dreams. That's what Jesus says it's like coming into the kingdom. What about pearls? Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who found a pearl of great value. Do you know, the most expensive pearl ever found was discovered uh, in 2006, and it's worth 75 million pounds. Jesus wants us to think about the value of his kingdom to us like that. And why not? Why not think about it like that? Think about it, complete forgiveness. What price can you put on that? Most of us, if, if we're honest, we don't know what that's worth. But if you've ever heard Simon Dust talk about um, doing alpha courses in prison, he'll tell you that if you stand up there at the front and invite people forward and say that they can be forgiven in Jesus' name, there's a rush. There's a rush of people. And the only difference between us and them is that like the merchant in the story, they recognize a pearl of great price when they see one. They recognize what Jesus' forgiveness is worth. What about eternal life? This week, I'm taking free funerals. And when you look in the face of someone who doesn't believe in Jesus and therefore thinks that they're not going to see the person they love again, you know what eternal life is worth. And then there's the relationship with the God who created the universe. We can get so used to saying things like we do in this church all the time that, you know, we feel God is saying this or that. And we can get so used to, um, you know, praying or saying things like, let's just pray, that we forget that we're talking about the conversation with the God who created the whole universe. Do you know, at uh, a celebrity auction, uh, someone bid £28,000 to have lunch with Harrison Ford. What's it worth to have a conversation with the living God? That's what we get. Surely it's worth all the money in all the banks in all the world. And we've not even got to the deliverance from sickness, addiction, guilt, and shame that the kingdom offers, the life of purpose, true belonging, and the knowledge that we're completely known, completely known, and completely loved. So why is Jesus so desperate for us to see that that's what his kingdom's worth? Well, it's because of what he asks from us to enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen again to the parable. He says, the merchant and the man in the field went away and sold everything they had so they could buy the treasure. They sold everything. We come to Jesus and we want to get a bit and we want to give a bit. But the author and retired pastor Tim Keller puts Jesus' offer to us like this. Unimaginable splendor for unconditional surrender. Unimaginable splendor for unconditional surrender. Nothing less is on the table. 
nothing in between. Because when we're talking about the kingdom, that's the only currency exchange that ever makes sense. I love how uh, Nick Butterworth puts it in his children's book, Stories That Jesus Told. This is a, a favorite of Felicity's, a favorite, let's, I'll be honest, in the Dixon household. And uh, he says this, Here is a man who buys and sells things. He has a fine fur coat and a felt hat with a floppy feather. It is his favorite. The merchant has everything he wants until one day in a shop window he sees something, something special. It is a wonderful white pearl. 500,000 pounds, says the man in the shop. He wants that pearl more than anything in the world, so he hurries home. He has a plan. He sells his furniture, his fridges, and his freezers full of food. He sells his house, his fountain, his fish pond. He sells his fine fur coat, but the felt hat with the floppy feather he keeps. It is his favorite. Off to the shop, he trundles to buy the pearl. Oh dear, he is still six pounds short. Sell me your hat for six pounds, says the man in the shop. The merchant laughs. He hands the man his hat and takes the pearl. Jesus says, God is like the merchant's pearl. It costs everything to know him, but he is worth more than anything in the world. I like that. It's like a game of poker. To receive the kingdom, you've got to go all in. I enjoy poker, uh, though I never play for money. That's probably because I'd lose it all. Uh, and I'll never forget the time that I beat my friend Tom, who's the best poker player I know. It was the last round of betting, and I put all my chips in. Because I knew that I'd been dealt the best hand there was. That's exactly Jesus' point. If you knew what you'd been dealt, you wouldn't hesitate to go all in. But if that's what it takes, then here's the question. What's your favorite felt hat? What's the favorite thing that you need to part with to gain the kingdom? Is it your image? Would you sell off the respect of your peers or your colleagues to publicly identify yourself with Jesus? Or is it your security? Talk to our mission partners and they'll tell you what that means. But we don't actually have to fly halfway around the world to give our security to Jesus. We just need to think a bit differently about the way that we use our bank account. What about our approach to the Bible? Simon was talking about that the other week, wasn't he? Are you willing to make God's word your plumb line? Are we willing to sell our freedom to do whatever we want, whenever we want, with whomever we want, in order to follow Jesus? Jesus says all that is not just necessary, but worth it to receive the kingdom. And yet so many people aren't sure, are they? They want the kingdom, but not the king. You see, many of our non-Christian friends, family, and acquaintances love all that transformational stuff. They love the food banks and the social justice. They love the yeast, but they can't get past the parable of the pearl at great price. Because ever since Adam and Eve, we've wanted to be the king of our own lives ourselves. So much so that it can be hard for people to commit to one another these days, can't it? Let alone commit to God. But just the other week, I was talking to some friends of mine in their 30s who've been together for several years, and I, I broached the topic of marriage, of them getting married. And, and if you looked at their faces, you'd think I'd let loose a cage of pigeons in their face. And yet Jesus wants our total commitment because you can't have a kingdom without the king, just as you can't have unsurpassed splendor without unconditional surrender. And sadly for some today, that's just too big a price to pay. Some are like the monkeys who live on some of the islands in the Indian Ocean. Apparently the people who live there have devised a very clever way to catch these monkeys. They take a coconut, they drill a hole in the top, empty out all of the insides and pop in a little peanut. The hole in the top is just big enough for the monkey to get its hand in to grab the peanut. But once it's got hold of the peanut, it can't pull its hand out again. And a monkey holding on to a coconut can't run quite so fast and certainly can't climb trees. And so the monkey gets caught and sadly the monkey gets killed. 
sadly, many today are willing to lose all that the kingdom offers for one pathetic little peanut. Is the alternative worth it? Well, it depends completely on what you're buying, doesn't it? Is the kingdom worth it? Well, if I asked you, is something that costs 500 pounds expensive? You'd say, I don't know. What is it? If I said it's a screwdriver, you'd say yes. If I said it's a Porsche, you'd say no. In fact, if I said to you, I'll sell you a Porsche for 500 pounds, do you have the money? You'd say, I'm completely penniless, but I'll be back in half an hour and I'll buy it. For the unsurpassing splendor of the kingdom, unconditional surrender is a bargain. No wonder Jesus says that the man who discovered the treasure sold everything he had with joy because he anticipated what was on its way. And to follow Jesus, we've got to do the same thing. We've got to anticipate what's on its way. Paul says, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again for Christ. But he says elsewhere in the Bible, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be, will be revealed in us. I was saying the same to a friend on Friday night who's, who's leaving a job that he has loved and it's been his life for years to go and train for Christian ministry. I was saying to him, remember what lies ahead. And in the same way, the, the writer of Hebrews encourages us to be like Christ, who for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Have you ever wondered where Jesus is in these last two parables? When you see it, it makes surrendering everything to him a whole lot easier. Isn't he the one who left the treasure behind in the field for us in the first place? Isn't he the one who impoverished himself, gave up the wealth of heaven for us to find it? Our wealth at his expense. But what about the story of the pearl? You know, there was a clam that had to die so that merchant could extract that pearl of great price. Jesus is that clam. Jesus is the one who died so that we could inherit the kingdom at the cost of his life given on a cross. You know, it's been said, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And so when we count the cost of the kingdom, yes, let's look ahead to the reward that's on its way. But let's also look back and not forget who truly bore the cost for us. All we need to do then is ask ourselves, will we reciprocate? Will we sell everything to gain the treasure that he willingly laid down his life for us to have? That's the question I want us to take away with us this morning. And that's where I'm going to end. And uh, I'm going to invite the band back up. And I'm going to also uh, invite, as, as the band play and as we pray, I'm going to invite some people in particular forward for prayer. Our prayer ministry team are going to, are going to come up in a moment. And um, I first of all want to invite you forward if, if what I've said about transformation has struck a chord for you and you're longing for that transformation of the kingdom in a particular area of your life this morning. And the second group of people I want to call forward is people who've heard me talk about giving up everything, and you know that there's an area of your life that you still need to surrender to Jesus. If that's you, can I invite you to the front? But last of all, I want to invite you, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never bowed the knee to the King, but you've heard what I've said about the kingdom of God this morning, and you'd like to, to come forward and receive what Jesus died for you to have. Let's stand, and let me pray, and then the band's going to lead us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you paid the great cost so that though we give everything to follow you, it's God's riches at your expense. We get to be that person who wins the lottery. We get to inherit all that was yours because you died on the cross for us. Lord, help us not to hesitate but to go all in. Father, we pray that as we do so, that we would encounter more of that transformation of the kingdom in our lives. Holy Spirit, would you come now? 
Would you bring that transformation in this place? Would you tear down walls as we surrender to you again?